here we go and record here we go all right ah we're live okay finally i fucking finally got it dude uh hey what's up you guys hi <laughs> welcome back it's me david rivas and this is fuck me with me david rivas hi it's been a minute the last time we were here, we had a drunk young lady named Sam Kaufman, and that was a whole mess. But now we're back with a whole different brand new mess. Um, yes, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Uh, so this is something that I've been debating about doing for a while, because I have a lot of, like, sex lit in my personal library that I haven't quite... Hold on, let me move this mic that I haven't quite um, got around to reading. And because of that, I was like, Ooh, you know what? I, I need to read this shit. Point blank period. I just need to read this bullshit. Not bullshit. I need to read it. If I'm going to have a podcast like this, I have to read it. And then the idea hit me the other day. I was like, wait a second. Why don't I just do like a digital book club type thing where I read this literature and talk about it as I go along and not necessarily give my like cold not give cold hard facts about what is in the literature but rather my interpretation of it as a uh, uh, queer BIPOC because uh, uh, I'm going through a gender thing right now I was gonna say a cis man but I don't necessarily know if that's what she's giving at this moment in my silk robe <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't necessarily know that that's what I'm giving, but hopefully through this exploration of like sex lit, I figure out how sex relates to me and my gender expression and my sorry, there's two different cameras going on right now. So I, I on the live y'all my bad. I'm probably looking up uh here, let me let me let me adjust. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so this is this is really just an exploration and a and a forcible way for me to actually read these books that I have purchased. And hopefully you guys can join me along for the ride and learn something as well, because I think we could all learn about sex, irregardless of our relation to it, or what we think is our tea or not. Like, bitch, we all got a lot of shit to learn. We're all just kids looking for a setter. Oh, what the hell? Oof. That cat really suctioned on. <sighs> Hold on, but first, mommy needs her juice. Word. Okay, so let's get started. The first book that we are going, or at least I'm going to go through, is The Ethical Slut by Janet W. Hardy and Dossie Easton. It's This is the third edition. Uh, this one was released in... I wrote this down, or at least I should have. What the fuck was this release? Twenty seventeen. There we go. I knew I had it highlighted. This one was released in twenty seventeen, so it's it's been a couple of years. There may or may not be some advancement in terminology, uh, but we're gonna roll with it. Uh, Something I feel I need to point out with this is this is this is just these people's interpretation of sex and non-monogamy and their relationship to genders and sex. I do not think it's representative of everybody as a whole and therefore it's going to be flawed. It's going to be it's going to they're going to make a couple like there's going to be a couple awkward moments where it's not necessarily the correct verbiage or it's offensive phrasing and we're going to, I'm going to do my best to address that and roll with it. But if at any point something, something is like clearly abhorrent or I don't want to say, uh, uh, politically correct, but if something is offensive or indicates or deals with a greater trauma that I may not understand, by all means, as my listeners and viewers, uh, please help me, please point it out. I'm happy to 
I'm happy to correct myself and therefore can further a conversation that needs to be had because that's the whole point of this. So hopefully if you are able to, uh, I don't know, read along with me and that, correct me if I ever need to be corrected or if I miss something that needs to be corrected in this in this book because they don't have an overarching worldview. They just have their particular experience and their understanding of it. Well, how we're going to do this is I'm going to go basically chapter by chapter for like every week. So every week I might do one, maybe two, probably just one chapter uh, because they're kind of, they're not dense, but I, I think, I think I definitely need to go through and break everything down as I go along. And because of that, that this will be about like 25 weeks of me posting weekly, reading a book. But you know what? Hey, that's why you're subscribed. Oh, hey, Jack. Hi, Lisa. Oh, am I Italian ex-king or royalty? Hey, Zan. Um, yeah, so this is going to be like a 25 week long adventure. This is just the first book I picked up off my shelf. Uh, I'm, I want to do more of these, but first let's see how this goes. So what are we going to go over today? Uh, I'm going to read a little bit about the, I've already read the chapter and the, and whatnot, but I'm just going to like highlight it. This is going to be an amalgamation of like a summary plus commentary. That way you get, uh, you get the, the juicy tidbits that I think people should note from the book and I can give my Bold face opinion because that's what I do best. So we're gonna go over the authors and then we're gonna go over the contents and then I'm just gonna like fuck up chapter one and see what the fuck is good. Okay, so first things first. This was written by Dossie Easton and Janet W. Hardy, and they describe themselves as like Dossie writes that they're a uh, licensed marriage and family therapist specializing in alternative sexualities and relationships. And that she has been an ethical slit since 1969, which diva, diva, old school slut, uh, weathered slut. I love that. I love that. I, I live specifically for older women embracing their, their sex and wielding it because I feel as though older women are given this bad rap of not being able to, sorry, I got to take a step, not being able to express sex openly or talk about it as uh, not flagrantly but as honestly as the younger younger generations are and that's not just because you get older that does not mean you stop fucking so i'm all about that diva work 1969 and janet w hardy is the founder of greenery press which is the publisher of this book and janet and dossie have written about Three other books as of 2017. I, they, they may have written more since then. But their other books are When Someone You Love Is Kinky. And that's for friends and family uh, and partners of anybody who is like hardcore into BDSM or alternative like sex play like leather, uh, dom sub. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this says cross-dressing, but I don't... I... I don't necessarily know if that's, like, the apropos term, so we're going to gloss over that. I'm going to go back in and read up on what that would be. And the new bottoming and the new topping book, they that's basically just topping and bottoming as, like, a dom or sub in the BDSM community. And Radical Ecstasy, uh, Journeys to Transcendence. And it's that one is just their personal accounts of how they found their non-monogamy and how it's... It really shaped and informed their experience with the world. So Dossie, in the book, right right in chapter one, this is like halfway through the chapter, she identifies as queer. She never really specifies as what, but she identifies as within the family, so snaps for that. And she has been committed to an open sexual lifestyle since 1969. And honestly, I think that just means that she's like, she's open, like open sexually. Like I'm in an open relationship and I'm, guessing that that's what she means but who knows but open might just mean she'll fuck whenever I, I i don't know i i i'm not necessarily know what she i'm not necessarily sure what she means by that right now but maybe it gets revealed later uh and janet is 
<laughs> diva janet apparently in the first edition of this book which is written in like 1999 uh lists themselves as Catherine a list a pen name that she used to use when her kids were underage when they were minors and now that they're older she's like fuck it this was this book was written by me janet and honestly respect for that that's that's sickening that's sickening i love i love that a mom after her kids grew up of course because that was i'm sure listing themselves under a pen name was a hard choice that they made for their children as a mother not necessarily as like a they were to me that for her to list herself under a pen name was her compromising her sexuality for her motherhood granted i'm not a mother i don't know i don't necessarily know if that's true or not but it it seems like society has set her up in a way to choose one or the other and I feel like at this point in her journey and from what I'm saying that she's marrying the two she's like yes I'm a mother but also hello now that my kids are older and I don't give a fuck who knows like I'm gonna let you guys know I wrote a fucking book about sex and that's sickening she also writes that like after her divorce she really found her sexuality so I it pretty much notes that she's like gender or not gender that she's like sexually fluid so lovely lovely divas uh it looks like both of their pronouns are she she hers um right off the bat i feel like that's something that could be addressed uh this the granted that's a very like 2021 mindset and not necessarily a 2017 mindset of everybody being more in tune with how we refer to each other's pronouns and the pronouns of groups as a whole so i think that's something that going forward maybe they could in the fourth edition maybe they can touch on even more uh because it doesn't seem very trans like gnc gnb uh, not friendly but sensitive it doesn't seem like those are communities that these women know about fully i think they they understand them and whatnot, but I don't necessarily, right off the bat, I don't necessarily know if they, they understand the trials and tribulations and therefore the sens sensitivities around gender and naming genders like that. But you live and you learn. All right. So this book is split up into like five, five parts. It's, there's part one is the welcome. Part two is the practices of practice of sluthood part three is navigating the challenges of sluthood four is sluts in love which hey uh and five is a conclusion it's that one's titled the slut utopia and all throughout it there's like exercises and i think i'm gonna do the exercises uh they're they're like sluts we know and love uh, well the exercises are named like sluts we know and love what is anger good for a hierarchy of hard like oof that a healthy breakup the airport game like i i don't know it seems i i love activity books and this seems like something uh right up my alley work <laughs> uh and in the book as well i forgot to mention there is a glossary with a whole bunch of the, these terms that this that i guess they think most people won't be in tune in tune with or maybe they are like a like theory terms f just from like glancing through it they're fairly like they're fairly like straightforward it's heteronormativity intersex leather bdsm this one not so really it's monogamish mononormativity munch munch is a social get-together of poly folk in a restaurant or a similar location munches have been established for many online communities other ways of meeting like-minded people include meetups, potlucks, and a munch. A munch? Is that just a... Girl, is that just going out for food with, like, polyamorous? See, I think it's, like, niche terms, but also... any the, the Most of these terms, I, I'm pretty sure most people have heard from Twitter. So, glad to see that in the zeitgeist of 2021, our... Our way of communicating is, like up to date with like old theory i guess um word so chapter one is titled who is an ethical slut and straight from the get-go 
these women, they're like, you know who an ethical slut is. There is a person in your mind that is, what did they say? Uh, oh, fuck, where is it? Fuck, 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 I have it highlighted. I thought I did. Oh, okay, here. This is a person who can discover the openness of being loving, lonely, intimate, and sexual with themselves and others around them. So, like, I, I think right off the bat, they worded this in a way that everybody can kind of picture who an ethical slut in their life would be or who they generally aligns with that. Right off the bat, for most of y'all, it's probably me. And you know what? Cheers to that. But I think they did, did a good job of describing who this book is for and what people can get out of it. And then... Uh, they point out within like the next couple of paragraphs that people have been succeeding at free love for many centuries uh often quietly without much fanfare and i right off the bat that struck me as like okay well who are these people you are in, you are referring to like who who has been succeeding at free love because as far as i've been raised it's monogamy this monogamy that catholicism catholicism this Christianity that like it's a very Eurocentric mindset when it comes to sex and relationships so who are these people that have been succeeding at this I think they failed to point out who the who those people are that they're referencing and I kind I googled it because I was like I, don't, eh, I wonder when the oldest well, account of like polyamory was or um I guess non monogamy, and it honestly, I think the oldest account it said was Mesopotamia, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, sorry, Mesopotamia and Assyria. Apparently, in Hammurabi, Hammurabi's code law, whatever it was, there is a there's like a subsection all about polyamory and how a man can marry another woman so long as that second woman isn't able to bear children, which. It's a no for me, but also that's like classic, classical, ancient mindsets and laws. So that's, eh. but polyamory goes back as far as that. And there are accounts of that because I Googled it and that came up in like five different articles. Like that was relatively one of the first, the first codified, not the first codified, the first generally agreed upon instance of polyamory in history or written down about it and I, I i think these women failed to point that out they're like oh this wasn't just like something these white people just thought of like this is something that's been around for uh, a hot minute so that's a little mm, it seems a little little eurocentric to me but hey they're experiencing the world through their mindsets and their experiences so who knows um and then the second like second part of this chapter is they go into depth about why they chose this title and they talk about how this is a reclamation of a derogatory term specifically for f they say women but i'm going to change that to and f please feel free to correct me if i'm wrong but i'm going to change that to femme identifying individuals that therefore it's like not just women but people who can be classified as not, i don't want to say classified but people who society mistakes as female or feminine or non-masculine i guess uh i i do feel slut is a term that is and they even pointed out they're like point blank period slut is a term that is ascribed to women and when you are given the same descriptors of a slut, but said on the on the like scope of a man, they're a stud or they're a they're a player, they're a they're a, they're a guy, they're they're just uh, a guy's guy, a cool guy. And already that establishes the inequalities or the inequities of what what femme identifying people go through in terms of their sex. It's stigmatized before they can even like express it more than once you know what if that makes sense like it, it, after 
in my experience, once somebody who identifies as femme has sex, if they have sex, like, literally with anybody else within the next year or so, they're automatically packed as a slut. So I think it's... Naming it this is immediately putting their finger on, hey, this is an in inequity, this is a double standard that we are going to reclaim and take pride in, which I think is pretty cool. <coughs> <coughs> oh, God. Uh, so I love that, and... Honestly, uh, they don't really talk about why it's ethical, like what, where the ethical part comes from. I think they mean doing it without malice, because like, you know, there there are people that are players, they're, they're, they love to play the field, they love to have sex with everyone and anyone, and I think they do so willfully disregarding the emotions of those around them and i think these women are talking about an ethical slut as somebody who like doesn't necessarily like hurt people through their sex and through having sex with everybody i think like somebody who's m morally fine but at the same time like a, a slut's a slut like there's there's still power to be had and they 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 are still people as well the people that aren't ethical sluts so i that for me is a little iffy but hey it's not my book i'm commenting on it but whatever uh they also oh god hold on what oh, okay <laughs> sorry they uh i'm a little stoned too uh <laughs> They, they, after they talk about why they chose the title, they talk about how they believe that living life as a slut and as sexually open and carefree, it enriches their lives more than, more than just the bed. It enriches it, like, socially, like, physically, health-wise. It enriches them, like, psycho psychically and mentally, like, it, it, to willfully participate in sex has overarching positive effects that go across across their daily lives and i think that's really cool and i i agree with that when you have sex fairly often typically you're in a better mood typically you're more in shape because hey 30 minutes of sex is like we're gonna round it up and say it's like equivalent roughly to like 20 minutes of cardio but like uh, there's a statistic out there that i'll have to look up for next episode like it, it Sex is a physical activity, and I don't know, I don't know about y'all, but the way I have it, baby, we do work up a sweat. Uh. <laughs> um, they also pointed out that, like, to be an ethical slut is to consciously choose and mindfully follow your sexual urges. Ur urges? <laughs> your sexual urges. And when they say cautious, or consciously choose, I think... I, I again I think they're pouring pointing out that moral divide of like okay I'm gonna have sex with this person because they are in an open relationship or they're not married the seventh and third the stars are aligned and if I have sex with this nobody can really comment on it that is an ethical ethical slut to them I think they really immediately need to f acknowledge that not every, people are human and they're gonna have sex with people unethically like extramarital affairs are a thing cheating is a thing and well well i believe that the actions of willfully following your urges at the cost of somebody else's emotions are unethical i think that they are still embracing sexuality in a way that is affirming for them and that needs that's a discussion that has to be a part of this and already i'm not seeing seeing any of that i don't know how a discussion like that would go i and i don't know if it really needs to be said but i no i i i for, Fuck that. Never mind. It needs to be said because it's there are people who live in this mindset 
and who op- conduct themselves like unethically and they're okay with it it gives it gives it's their judge we got to talk about it we have to include that in these dialogues but again this is their view what have you and okay let's see what else they also go on to like i guess reaffirm what a slut is they say to us a slut is a person of any gender who celebrates sexuality according to the radical proposition that sex is nice and pleasure is good for you so a slut is anybody that has sex just to feel good and to give pleasure and to live in pleasure and to create it again i think that's exactly why unethical sluts should be included in this conversation as well but then again i bought this book called ethical sluts so i don't know why i'm whining about this um they talk about uh sluts being heterosexual homosexual asexual bisexual and radical activists or being per- peaceful suburbanites so they're essentially just saying sluts are everywhere sluts are everybody and anybody and i agree with that wholeheartedly anybody can be a slut i i hope everybody chooses to be a slut at one point in their life or at least just has that little moment of like hey i'm gonna hold around for a little bit um word and they these are like oh no the light went out oh well my ring light went out r.i.p fuck my drag but i still look good anyway look at this skin honey get into it i think it's nice that they're that they're so affirming in the fact that anybody can be a slut and not just placing it as a term upon femme women or the femme community it's somebody it's this a sluthood is for everybody and by everybody and therefore it's it's a universal term i i love that i think that's really nice and i don't necessarily think a lot of people think like that thanks thea uh, I, my teeth are kind of glowing, but that's just because of the blue light on the computer. But, uh, they also talk about how sluts share their sexuality as philanthropists. Like, it's, um, they have a lot of it to share, but that doesn't necessarily make them, like, more physically fit. They just, like, they indulge in it a little bit more. They aren't as tied to guilt with sex as a, as we are conditioned to in this in I want to say most Eurocentric societies or European influ- European influence societies like in the US I feel like we are a very sex positive nation but not a very s- sex affirming nation like it, it we're all about having sex but God forbid if you have sex with more than one person as the good book says like it there's this inequity and i think that to describe a slut as somebody who is philanthropic in their venture to just give pleasure and therefore make people feel good and make the world feel good i think that's nice and i think that could be something that we all take away from from slutting around and being a hoe hi mom (laughs) What is next? Um, okay. They also have this, um, this section uh, about sluts where they're talking about how they are, they're not necessarily like sex gods. <laughs> and I really like how they're pointing out that like, you can be a slut, but you can also kind of like, not being an Italian stallion. Um, and like, just because you have a lot of sex doesn't mean you last long in bed or that you're this big, this wide, this loose, this, that, and the third. Like, it, it just means you have sex a lot. There's no physical descriptors or indicator of a slut other than the fact that they are actively just having sex a lot in, at any given moment. I like that. I, I like that it 
takes away this notion of like, oh, she's a slut because she took this many inches fine or because she has a wide set vagina or he's a slut because he sat on that no issue he took that fist like no 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 there are no physical indicators of of being a slut it's just some it's a way of life it's how you conduct yourself like inter interpersonally and i i i like that they're removing the the physical image of a slut and replacing it with a social image of more of more of the life of the party person is the slut rather than like the girl with like wider hips or the guy with a fatter ass like it's it, it it's more it breaks down the just the visual descriptors and i really like that uh okay what is next that's why i shouldn't drink it and smoke before i film these but whatever I'm gonna go south. Mm. Okay. They also talk about how one of the most valuable things we learn from open sexual lifestyles, so being a slut, is that our programming about love, intimacy, and, intimacy and sex can be rewritten. I would like to say that I believe wholeheartedly we as human beings, as natural creatures, are not programmed inherently to view uh, intimacy, love, and sex as specific ways. We just happen to have established societies that force us to view them in specific ways. Biologically speaking, I do not think... I think, sure, we might lean a certain way just because of tastes and experiences and whatnot, but I, they, they talk about programming and people aren't computers. People are people. They're, they're going to change daily to day to day, week to week, year to year, this and the third, decade to decade. Like, we don't come with a programming. We, our experiences shape that programming and yeah yes it can be rewritten but i don't know i i guess i'm just getting tripped up on the idea of programming like that doesn't sound that's that's not it for me but hey still have you and then at the end of this chapter they talk about what is in this new edition and essentially, they just talked about how they've given more attention to people of color, asexual, and aromantic people. <coughs> Excuse me. People in their teens and early 20s, which I think we've had enough. We don't need any more of our uh, teens and early 20s accounts of sex. Uh, people of non-binary gender and other groups that too often receive short shrift, which, love that, I love a short shrift, from sex-positive communities. I love that. I, I, I love that they've, they wrote a book decades ago and they, they saw the world around them change enough to where they said, okay, we need to go back and we need to reevaluate re what we said and include more voices and more thoughts and thinkings on what sex is and could be and who has had the platform to speak on it, which, hey, I'm all about platforms. That's what the fuck this is. So, uh. Then they go on to say, a long overdue conversation about the nature and nuance of sexual consent has moved into the forefront of cultural dialogue. And truly, I think the turning point for me personally in the consent-based dialogue was... I should say this is this is this is probably a trigger a triggering part of this podcast. So if you are a if you are a victim of a sexually aggressive act or sexual assault, I would suggest you skip about a minute or two forward, maybe 3 in in lieu of what what's to follow. I think the first turning point for me 
in terms of the dialogue of consent was the Brock Turner case. That's truly when my my censors were going up about, oh, consent is this. You can s agree to sex, but then you can also change your mind before it is even started, before it is completed, before you even get there. Consent is something you are continually giving. It is not given once and held through. It is something living and breathing. It's it's a living and bre breathing agreement between two people that can change at the drop of a dime, at the turn of a hat, whatever. It, it changes moment to moment sometimes, and that's all right. I, I think it's very important to talk about consent, especially a book, in a book spearheaded by women and already so in tune to the femme experience. It's something that needs to be talked about that I don't ever believe we will talk about enough because people are still getting away with sexually aggressive acts. So I thought it was a lovely... A lovely sign of, no, not a lovely sign at the time, but I thought, I thought it was very necessary and very good that they pointed this out. And then the rest of the chapter, they just talk about, uh, Kinsey, really, oh, fuck, the language of the book, whoops. <laughs> uh, this is also probably a good, uh, good point for me to know as well. The language of this book is written in 2017 by by I forgot to look up if they were white, but they, I'm feeling I'm feeling the caucasity. I'm feeling the Eurocentric Anglo-Saxon vibes from these people, from these women. So I, I think there will be moments where. It is not. It's not the T in terms of. political correctness it, it's there there are going to be inappropriate moments and mistakes in in the dialogue and i'm sure i will also have my trip ups and my mistakes in my conversation and my dialogue but i would like to open open it up to to the viewers and the listeners please by all means correct me and maybe we could figure out a way to better have these conversations going forward uh it is never my intent to cause harm or trigger trauma especially because sex can often be associated with intense trauma sometimes it is never my intent to live in a negative space i would like to live in an, affir an affirming uh, positive space with sex so i i'm going to do my best to correct the language as I read, but also correct my language as I speak. Thank you, distinguished panel of judges. Thank you. Yes, that's that's all I'm gonna say on on that. Yeah. But yeah, uh, after they talk about that, they just talk about Kinsey and like I've already got Kinsey's books. They're on my shelf. Kinsey's gonna have his whole... Kinsey and the Kinsey Institute will have their own moments. I am not going to address them. They just have a little, like, short little blurb, like, two-page blurb about him and his work and the work of his wife and the Kinseyites, whatever they call him, the Kinsey Institute, for a couple pages. And we'll do that later when we go over Kinsey. Right now, let's leave this platform for, for the girls! For the girls! Yeah, so that was the first chapter. Uh, this is a little longer than I expected, but hey, I had a lot of fun talking and I had a lot of fun thinking about that. Uh, my thoughts are, I'm excited about this. I'm really excited to read about sex and talk about it in theory and like with these theoretical terms and concepts I might I not I may or may not be accustomed to or comfortable with even I think it will be interesting and it's gonna it's gonna teach me and it's gonna make it force my ass to grow and learn <coughs> oh god I don't know why I'm tripping 
and hopefully it makes y'all do the same. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I do think this book is a little Eurocentric in how they are speaking and what they are speaking about. But that is not to say that these women are not in tune with cultural sensitivity and the the contributions trans GN B, G, N, C, B, I, P, O, C people have made in these dialogues about sex. I think at the point that they were writing these, these, these books, there wasn't a full understanding, and I think that's okay. Uh, not, not that it's okay, like, morally. I think that's okay in terms of, like, discussing it. Like, I, it's not gonna always be right, and that's okay. We're gonna acknowledge it, move on. Oh, I don't know what the hell just happened. We're gonna acknowledge that and move on. Yeah, I I really am excited to see what queer older women have to say about non-monogamy. I don't necessarily think that is something I have been privy to as somebody who has for the most part, identified as, like, a cis gay man for the last couple of years, but now that I don't necessarily identify... Hi! For those of you who don't know, I, I go by he, they now. They, he. It's interchangeable for me, but I don't necessarily always feel like a, a cis man or somebody who can be labeled as a man. I sometimes feel in between femme and mask. Like, I... I I don't know what gender I am most days. Like, well, not most days, but uh, I don't know what gender I'm going to be when I wake up. It just kind of, like, comes to me. In the way I dress, in the way I sh interact, in the way I talk, it it's, a different, it's different for me day to day, and it would be nice, and it is going to be nice to see what these women have to say about non-monogamy and about sex and about gender as women. Like, I, I... Women of a certain age as well. I think this is very interesting and I am ex so excited to see what they have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you guys liked this episode. I, I feel... I feel like it's kept me on my toes and it's made me think a lot more and be much more engaged with the actual words I'm reading. If y'all could see, I wrote down a fuck ton of notes. Like, well, <laughs> yeah, a, fuck ton, a page and a half, a fuck ton of notes. But my book is highlighted. I have, I have highlights and notes in this too. Like, I, 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 I like having an active discussion about books like this and literature. I missed it. I This is not necessarily something I got in school in the way I wanted. So I'm happy to create this opportunity for myself and hopefully for others as well. And if you would like to join me for next week when we read chapter two, and chapter two is titled... Myths and Realities... Please let me know. I I would oh shit. I would love for you guys to join me in reading this. I would also love to help you guys find a a means to read this book. If you it is not something financially possible for you, I'm happy to help you find a digital copy. I'm all about getting shit for free and stealing. So let's work it out, boo boo. Mama, let's do it. I got you. I got you covered. I got you. Wait, hold on. I got you covered. Ah, oh, my light is back now. I'm beautiful. Yeah, I will see you guys next week. Uh, as always, thank you so much for watching Fuck Me with David Rivas. With me, David Rivas. And this is a very special first episode of Fuck Me in the Library. I also don't know if I said that earlier, but this segment is called Fuck Me in the Library. Shh, quiet. Um, 
yeah. So follow, follow Fuck Me Pod. Follow me at, at Wang Daddio. Oh, I also wrote, choreographed, directed, costume designed, currently helping compose, like, I, I, my own movie. So please, 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 uh, hit me up there. Uh, yeah. Bye, guys. Uh, that movie is called The Garden Film on Instagram. So thank you so much, guys. See y'all later.